What does escape the backrooms, hide from the player off camera and lights out? Thalassophobia, cave, water damage, darkened suburbs, bumper crop, and true ending areas. Escape the Backrooms is a multiplayer horror experience that lands you and your friends in an array of backrooms inspired locations, where you must brave a variety of horrific entities while attempting to escape this liminal nightmare. Today, we'll be taking a look at some stuff we're not typically supposed to see, like the entirety of The Thing on Level 7, and even some inaccessible content you probably didn't know was in the game. We'll also be breaking a bunch of stuff as we go, and I mean really breaking it. So I hope you enjoyed today's look behind the scenes of Escape the Backrooms. After defeating the animated king and riding the roller coaster to freedom, we arrive at level 6, Lights Out. Once here, we make our way through a couple of dark hallways before catching a peek at this level's entity, the Wretch. Just ahead, we arrive at a room containing a handful of helpful resources, including four LiDAR scanners. This tool has a couple of useful features, including a radar that detects nearby entities, as well as a light projector that emits colorful particles onto the pitch black walls of this maze. Unfortunately, flashlights are of no use here, so our only method of escape is to map out the walls with these particles while also trying to avoid being caught by the wretch. Eventually, we arrive at a bright hallway and go through a door, leading us to the next section of the game. Heading back to the start of this horrific labyrinth, we can see that the roller coaster we rode in on is still up on the tracks behind us. This entrance area extends slightly outwards before coming to an end and the back wall is hidden by this shadowy block. And speaking of darkness, if we take a look at the no flashlight zone with everything brightened up, well, uh, it's still dark. Unlike the other dark areas in this game, all the walls in this particular maze are completely black and cannot be lit up by other light sources. However, if we add a light source beneath the map to illuminate this labyrinth, we'll be able to see the insides of these hallways with the help of environmental fog. Although everything within this area is still pitch black, we will be able to see the silhouettes of various pieces of furniture as we look around, including this, uh, floating cabinet? I'm not sure why this is here, but it probably went unnoticed due to the lack of visibility in this area. As for the dots created by the LiDAR scanner, they appear to be solid colored decals that are projected onto the walls, and a blooming effect is applied to them, which results in this cool visual appearance. Now heading out of bounds, there is a large gray plane above this maze, meaning we can see the entire layout of this level from down below. This is a pretty large maze, considering we must traverse it mostly blind, and can only map a path forward using the particles we project on the walls. Now typically on this map, we cannot see the wretch itself beyond their jump scare animation. We can really only see their silhouettes as they walk in front of the LiDAR scanner's particles. But with the post-processing effects turned off, they are plainly visible, giving us the opportunity to look at them a bit closer. They're mostly humanoid in appearance, although they seem to be missing their skin and have unusually sharp canine teeth. Observing their jump scare from a different perspective, we can see that they lean back, pose like they're on a super dope album cover, and then explode the player a moment later. With the lighting effects turned on, we can see that a light is projected onto them as this animation starts, resulting in a pretty frightening jump scare. We will of course be messing with the wretch a bit later in the video, but for now, let's continue onward to the following level. When you're lost in a liminal maze trying to escape, there's a lot of pressure. But can you imagine if you dropped something precious in the back rooms and had to go back and find that lost item? Thankfully, in real life, we have an easier solution with Exter and their slick wallets. I've been using my Exter wallet for about two years now, and it honestly has held up very well for all the crap I've put it through. It's slim, RFID protected, and keeps everything easily accessible with one click of a button. You can also pair it with their solar powered tracker so you can find your wallet anywhere if you lose it. Which is incredibly handy if you ever leave your wallet in the back of a taxi. Exter has a lot of other sleek products as well, so click my link in the description below and use code HSCOPED to get up to 55% off during their Black Friday sale. And a big thanks to Exter for sponsoring this video. After navigating this maze, we arrive at level 7, Thalassophobia. In this level, we find ourselves in a flooded house that appears to be floating atop a massive body of water. There are a bunch of other houses in the distance, and we can travel to them using this small wooden boat. Our goal in this location is to row our way through the fog, searching these homes for supplies, and eventually coming across a lighthouse near one of the homes. We put on a diving helmet and then drop into the water using a shark cage. Now, this cage is made to protect against sharks, and not whatever the heck that thing is. But we're lucky enough to drop beneath them just in time. From here, we're meant to swim out of the cage and into the cave system, where we will arrive at the next location. So after restarting the level, I decided to get an aerial shot of this massive ocean, and that doesn't even begin to describe it. Zooming all the way out, we can see that the sky and clouds are textured on the inside of this giant sky dome. 
and by the time we reach the walls of this dome, the houses we usually explore look like a few grains of rice at this distance. Taking it a step further, we can fly beyond the walls and get a good look at this dome from the outside. Playing through this map, you would never guess that the entirety of level 7 takes place in one half of the Death Star. But hey, the more you know! Heading back inside the map, we can see there is a distinct dark square surrounding the player. And to my knowledge, this is actually used for when the player dips below the water's surface. As you can see, when we move the camera underwater, it appears as though we're actually underwater, and everything has this sort of hazy appearance. Moving beyond this cube, we can take a look beneath the surface once again, where we will be able to see into the void. Looking around beneath the water surface, we can see the rest of the houses are fully modeled, and extend downwards where we typically can't see. Now heading over to the shark cage, where we begin our aquatic voyage, we can throw on the diving helmet, and viewing this from another angle is honestly hilarious. As soon as we pick one up, it appears in our hands, and as we place it on our head, it becomes several times larger. I mean, this thing is nearly half our size, and it's giving me some serious Bioshock vibes. This is done so that, to the player, it appears as though we're looking through the inside of the helmet, and we typically never know it was this gigantic. Now, we usually can't see this occurring because the screen goes black, but as soon as we dip below the water's surface, the rest of the map's assets will unload, and the undersea portion will then appear beneath us. Of course, this is when the thing on level 7 appears and tries to eat us, and I'm sure a ton of you are curious what the rest of this creature looks like. As you can see, this massive creature is actually an anglerfish, and although the drawing at the start of the level depicts them as being more serpent-like, their tail is actually comically small compared to what I was expecting. Their mouth is lined with long, sharp teeth though, and they are incredibly menacing given their gargantuan stature. As we drop beneath them, they'll close their mouth and swim above us before ultimately unloading. Before moving on, while looking through the game files, I stumbled across an older, incomplete version of this map. As you can see, it's a lot smaller than the completed level, and there are only a handful of houses scattered throughout. There isn't much to this area at this point, but what I found pretty funny is if we delete the boat blocking the door, then we can just, uh, walk around on top of the water! There's also a floating door, just off to the right, that can be opened and closed, but not much else. That's not the only thing I found in the game files, though, because I also managed to find the original thing on level 7 entity, and spawning it in, we can take a quick look at it. It's a bit more accurate to the drawing at the start of the level, as it has a long eel-like body, glowing blue eyes, and several fins extending from its torso. I'm not sure why this model wasn't used, because it's actually pretty awesome. That's it for Thalassophobia, though, so let's take a quick look at level 8, the cave system. After surfacing inside this damp cavern, we grab some supplies and then head through this chamber that blasts us with bug spray. Spoiler alert, it's for good reason, as this initial cave section is filled with female death moths. You have to sneak carefully in order to avoid alerting these monstrous insects as you progress further into the caves. Eventually, you come to a rickety bridge that will collapse if you're not careful, and then you head into another bug spray chamber. Now our goal is to avoid the patrolling skin stealers during our search for the exit, and as we enter the small passageway, we will come to a bottomless ravine. Before we can reach the other side, we will have to take a detour by climbing this ladder, leading us to level 0.11. First off, this map is pretty large, and I wasn't expecting it to all be in one singular map. My assumption was that by passing through those bug spray chambers, we would load in the next section of the level and unload the one behind us. However, upon closer inspection, we can see that these doors can actually be deleted, and we can continue on as normal. Jumping ahead to the hole that we cross in the first section, we can see that at the bottom of this gaping pit is a large piece of black geometry. If you try sprinting across the bridge, it will snap directly in the center, and you will die the moment you touch that black death barrier. But I'm not done with this bridge just yet. So while investigating this area, I learned that if you stop time like Dio, and then start it again, there's a chance that this bridge will, uh, get violent. That's the only way I can describe it. Each of the boards that stretch across this gap are glitching around at an insane speed. Of course, my first thought was to see what happens if we touch it, and much to my surprise, nothing happened. The bridge simply resets back to its regular position, and even splits in half when we sprint across it. But I'm not quite satisfied yet, so I place the character next to the bridge and begin messing with the game's speed. And the instant the bridge begins glitching out, we're sent flying backwards. What's crazy is that we're hit hard enough by these boards to glitch into the floor. 
and when walking forward, we drop down out of bounds. But that's not the craziest part, because when we fell through the level, all of this map's entities fell with us. Yes, all the death moths and skin stealers were thrown into the eternal darkness alongside the player. That's how strong this thing is. The monsters in this level are dangerous, but this bridge is without a doubt the scariest entity here, man. And because the third time's a charm, I make one last attempt at crossing, only to be spiked into the void like a volleyball. Yikes. Now at the end of this level, we are typically unable to cross this gap due to an invisible barrier. But if we teleport the player to the other side, we can completely skip ahead to level 9. But before doing so, let's take a peek at level 0.11. So after climbing the ladder, we arrive at a map that's similar in appearance to level 0. And heading forward, we arrive at a small section of what I believe is level 0.2. Here, we must use a set of lights to obtain a code used for a locker. And, uh, for some reason, the number of sections of the wall didn't load in. They were replaced by this tiled texture instead, which made it a bit more difficult to decipher. We then open this locker and use said code to obtain a chainsaw, which is used to move onward, where we clip into level 0.11, water damage. Here we navigate a maze similar to level 0, and then pull some levers to open a gate on the far side of the map. Of course, we're not alone as Bacteria, also known as the Howler in this game, will be patrolling the halls in search of the player. After opening the gate, we pass through level 188, where we use the lit up windows to obtain a code used for the door. Here we take an elevator back to the cave system, where we can then enter level 9, the darkened suburbs. So rewinding time, we can see the area we load into after climbing the ladder is actually attached to level 0. The rest of the map is loaded in, and this small section is simply added onto it. Although the entrance is blocked by a vent cover that can only be destroyed using a crowbar. Now if we head into the room we access using the chainsaw, we can see that the hallways don't actually lead anywhere and are obscured by these dark squares. We can also watch from another angle what happens when we noclip into the next section of this level. As you can see, the moment this is triggered, the player's model unloads and the next level loads in. Moving the camera out of bounds, we can see Bacteria is once again stored in a box out of bounds, although this is not the same entity we encountered previously. As you can see, when this Bacteria is moved into the map, they will patrol these hallways indefinitely instead of teleporting around the player's location. So something you may notice is that when looking at the map from an aerial view, level 188 is not currently present. Even if we teleport the player beyond the steel gate at the end, the door can be opened, but it does not lead anywhere since this portion of the level is not yet loaded in. It's a bit hard to see, but the moment we pull the fourth lever, this area will load in behind that door. Although, there is a black border around it, which is why you cannot see it. We can delete these black rectangles though, and view things from out of bounds. Though they appear to be modeled inside, only a couple of these windows lead to an actual room. We can stand inside of them as they do contain walkable ground, but looking at these other rooms, well, they don't actually exist. They're just projections that are overlaid on top of the window itself, and they move the camera's position to simulate a 3D space. This is typically done so that the developer does not have to fully model a room that the player would usually never be able to access. That's pretty much everything of interest I found here, so let's jump ahead to level 9, the darkened suburbs. So we load in on the sidewalk of a foggy suburb in the dead of night, and after exploring a bit you come to the entrance of the abandoned outpost. From here your goal is to enter the homes that are highlighted on the screen, and activate the security terminals that are inside. Some of these houses are guarded by a wretch, and you'll have to evade them in order to complete your objective. You're not safe on the outside either though, since the neighborhood watch is roaming the streets and will pursue the player if spotted. After activating all three security terminals, you return to the outpost where you can now enter the facility. Once inside, your objective is to locate four bottles of almond concentrate, while avoiding the wretch that is roaming these corridors, and then insert the bottles into a chemical shower. You must then lure the wretch onto a pressure plate, where they'll be trapped inside of a cage, and then using the chemical shower, you turn them back into a human. After collecting the ID card from their neck, you can return to the suburbs and continue on to the following level. So, rewinding time, I immediately turn the lights on, which makes this area a lot less spooky. We can take a good look at the neighborhood watch now, and all their disgusting features. They are a massive eyeball monster that looks to be covered in blood, and instead of feet, they have four hands that extend from the bottom of their head. Heading into one of the houses, I also want to take a look at the wretch. As you can see, this is not the same entity we encountered in level 6. Although they are mostly the same in appearance, these particular versions are carrying a crowbar instead of walking around empty-handed. Because of this, their jump scare is different as well, and as you can see, they violently swing the crowbar at us before we explode into tiny pieces. They're still horrible to look at though. While playing through this level, I realized that it's actually pretty easy to break the neighborhood watch. So if you get their attention and they begin chasing you, and then you run up onto a porch, they can actually softlock themselves as they try returning to their normal pathing. 
If done correctly, they will just endlessly run into the wall until they locate the player again. Meaning, if we're careful, we can avoid having to deal with them at all. Softlocking them wasn't enough for me though, so I decided to face them head on. Only to make things more fair, I made the player absolutely massive. When they came in contact with my player controller, the jump scare animation started, resulting in them looking right up at me. When we actually died, for some reason our torso flew way up into the sky, and the monster just walked away, still leaning backwards. Heading onward to the abandoned outpost, we can view this map from an aerial perspective, where we'll find that the section resembling level 0 is actually the largest section of this level. It's a bit odd considering we can't usually access this area during normal gameplay. But by breaking down the wall, we can walk around in here and explore a bit. It's mostly empty inside, but what I found rather interesting is that the wretch is incapable of entering this area. Even if they're chasing us down, they will stop the moment we enter this location. While I was in here, I also found that this out of bounds area extends further than we can typically see. And by going around the corner, we can walk around on these sections of the floor that extend beyond the walls. Some of these walls are transparent from the outside, and what's kind of cool is that we can walk up to the lockers and hide inside of them, even though they're within the map and we are standing out of bounds. Now, when we trap the wretch inside of the cage, they are typically hidden by the particle effects when the chemical shower is activated. But if we move the camera inside of the mist, we can watch them change instantaneously from a wretch back into a human. Something else I was curious about is what happens if the player comes in contact with a wretch when they are locked in the cage. So I spawned a wretch on top of the pressure plate and locked myself inside with them. But no jump scare occurred. We can safely move around in here, although it is a bit claustrophobic. Attempting to delete the cage surrounding them results in the entire contraption being removed, including the wretch inside. That's it for this level though, so let's head into level 10, the bumper crop. So immediately after loading in, we find ourselves on a long stretch of road between two wheat fields. And as we venture onward, we must be careful not to be snuck up on by the facelings, this level's entity. They'll continue their approach from either side, and will only leave if spotted by the player. After reaching the barn at the end of this road, we will then have to walk through several long stretches of this dense field, following the lights on the windmills and turning them on as we go. We're not in the clear yet though, because facelings, wielding chainsaws, will begin hunting us down through these crops. Eventually we come to a large parking lot that leads us to level 3999, the true ending. Where upon entering this arcade area and walking down a hallway, we reach the current end of Escape the Backrooms. Now jumping back a bit, we can take a look at this massive farmland from an aerial perspective. And it's definitely one of the bigger maps in this entire game. The wheat fields we travel through to reach the arcade are lined with various sized fence off sections. And from up here, you can see exactly how this area is laid out. It's really not that difficult of a maze, but the wheat and chainsaw wielding monsters definitely make it a bit harder. Something else I want to check out was this blocked off section near the barn and where it potentially leads. We can see that behind these logs, there is a hidden pathway but we are unable to reach it under normal circumstances. If we delete these logs though, we can freely walk beyond it and explore this out of bounds area. The path leads to yet another roadblock, and beyond it is a small section of road that leads into the void. There are no entities over here, and we can freely wander as much as we want. Now, something I was curious about is how the facelings behave off camera when they come from those fields. And moving the camera above the player, we can see that as we make our way down this road, they'll begin loading in just out of sight. After turning to face them, they will just walk out of sight before unloading again. Similarly, we can see that the chainsaw faceling also just sort of appears as we pass that first windmill, and will then begin chasing the player. Speaking of the chainsaw faceling, we can watch the jump scare from a different angle and it's pretty funny. The moment this jump scare occurs, the player's model unloads and then they sort of just cut into the air slowly. As if killing us wasn't enough, they then apose on us to assert dominance. I get that you're a remorseless killer entity and all, but that's just unnecessary, man. Finally, we can take a look at level 3999 which is, at the time of this recording, the final level in Escape the Backrooms. And from outside the map, we can see how this level is actually put together. There's a large checkered floor that extends outside this main lobby area, as well as the hub entrance just off to the left side. We can also see this expansive hallway that lights up in the final cutscene, but I was curious what exactly was down those halls. Teleporting the player beyond the trigger for said cutscene means we can explore this area unhindered. And it's actually pretty cool walking around back here. This main hall itself comes to an end, and there's nothing back here but some more empty hallways. 
And with that, we finish this look behind the scenes of levels 12 through 22 in Escape the Backrooms. Although that's everything the game has to offer currently, the developer is still releasing frequent content and updates. So make sure you subscribe today for future coverage on Escape the Backrooms and much, much more. Thanks for watching and cheers.